Well, we're going to get started. As you heard, we are recording this. And if you enjoy it so much and want to share it with folks, it will be on our YouTube channel afterward, um, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, I am Kim Kelderhouse. I'm the executive director of the Leelanau Historical Society. My coworker, Elizabeth Adams, is behind the scenes in the chat and the Q&A to help anybody who might have trouble. If you um, have any audio issues or video issue or you know video issues tonight, please go ahead and put that in the chat and Elizabeth will try to troubleshoot things with you as best as possible. And then if you have questions for Chris tonight during his program, um, please put those in the Q&A. Both the chat and the Q&A appear at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you're on a phone, you might have to uh, swipe left or right to get to that feature. Um, but yeah, put questions in there for Chris and he'll answer them at the end. I am just going to reference my notes real quick and see um, what else I needed to cover with you tonight. Oh, we are going to be giving away a few copies of Chris's book. So anybody who attended tonight will draw some names tomorrow and be in touch by email. We'll be drawing three names. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And if you're not one of those winners, we do sell that in our museum gift shop. So please take a look and um, support your local historical society, us, uh, by making a purchase in the gift shop. Um, if you're new to the Leelanau Historical Society and the kinds of things we do, we do programs like this um, all throughout the year, either on Zoom or in person. Um, just depends on, on the, the topic and the um, presenter. Um, we are in the midst of our 2024 schedule and getting things finalized for that. So please stay tuned for um, more exciting programs like this um, and other things. Um, and if you enjoy this, please consider donating. We are in the midst of our year end uh, fundraising drive. Um, gifts at this time of year support all aspects of the work that we do at the Historical Society. Uh, you can find links to donate um, at the end of this webinar. Something should pop up on your screen. Otherwise, go to our website, leelanawhistory.org, um, become a member, make a year end gift. Um, every little bit helps. So thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to pass things over to Chris. Chris, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'm really looking forward to seeing your photos. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. My name is Chris Roxburg. I'm a underwater photographer and diver and fifth generation in Leelanau County. I've been exploring our waters my whole life and grew up uh you know, swimming and snorkeling our local waters. And about seven years ago, I took some pictures and videos of a local shipwreck. And it was the first time videos and pictures have ever been taken of it called the George Rogers. And that's what started my whole journey into this uh, scuba diving and underwater photography that I do now. So everything's happened pretty fast. And I've got uh, national and international recognition for the work that I do. And I'm <clears throat> pleased to present to you guys a new presentation today that I put together for the Leelanau Historical Society. And let's get to it. So here's my boat. As you can see, I got a jacket on and a hat. I go out late and early season looking for shipwrecks uh, around Leelanau County. And Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan are the three main lakes that I love to dive and explore. And my my new boat is uh, equipped with side scan sonar that has down imaging to find shipwrecks and also a GPS um, motor that I can control with a controller to uh, slowly get into shallow spots. Um, I not only do the deep shipwrecks, but I also like to do shallow stuff as well. So we're gonna talk about my book real quick. This is my book, Leelanau Underwater. This is the book that will be gifted to several people uh, through the Leelanau Historical Society after the show that was just talked about. Uh, exploring shipwrecks in Leelanau County in the Manitou Passage. This is the first film that I've ever done on shipwrecks. Uh, this is when I went 
and took my paddleboard during the winter um, with a wetsuit on and I paddleboard during the winter. I'm out all the time. And I got some really great video and pictures of the George Rogers. And that's what sparked my interest to get into underwater photography. And here's the video. You can see the snow on the bluffs here in the background. Uh, this is just south of Peterson Park in Northport, Michigan, Leelanau County. This is before I started scuba diving. Water's crystal clear. It was 34 degrees, absolutely freezing cold. You can see my paddleboard up here. So this is the first video. of any shipwreck that I've ever taken. And you can see that our water is crystal clear. Uh, we have invasive zebra mussels and quagga mussels that filter the water. Uh, for a photographer, it's great, but for the environment, it's not. Each mussel filters one liter of water per day. And since they've been in the Great Lakes, they've filtered out uh, much of the algae and particulate uh, that's needed for many species to survive and thrive. Um, so what that does is it helps with photography, but it's actually very bad for the environment. So a lot of the pictures you'll see, there's not a lot of fish, um, but the pictures are very clear from the help of the zebra and quagga mussels filtering the water. This is the shipping and trade in the Manitou Passage. The Manitou Passage has been one of the busiest shipping lanes in all the Great Lakes. And that is right off the shoreline of my home. This is a shipwreck here called the Francisco Morazan. And this is what it looked like down in the left corner here before it sank on South Manitou Island. Here's a picture of the Francisco Morazan uh, right after it ran aground. It ran up on a shoal in gale winds, and it was a cargo ship that had general goods, um, including shampoo and canned chicken. And you can see this early freighter here um this this ship was was actually a warship that was taken from the nazis and reconstituted to a uh, shipping vessel and it went out for its last uh delivery of the season and gale winds came up and it got stuck on the south manitou shoal and what happens is, is that if these ships aren't freed up and removed off the shoal, uh, we have very cold winters that produce a lot of ice and ice sheets. And the ice sheets have a lot of momentum and force behind them. And they can tear a steel ship like this right to pieces. And that's what actually happened. So as you can see in this picture, uh, this is some fog actually rolling in over South Manitou Island. And you can see here where my cursor is, this is the wreck of the Francisco Morazan. You can actually see that on Google Earth. Google, Google Earth is a tool that I use to locate shallow shipwrecks. Um, you can usually locate shipwrecks about 20 feet or less deep. And you can see here where the cursor is, this is another shipwreck. This situation here is one of the only situations where a shipwreck ran over another shipwreck. So the Francisco Morazan hit the shoal, South Manitou Shoal, in the exact same spot as the Walter L. Frost did. And it flattened the Frost uh, shipwreck and continued to drift um, inland towards shore here. And both wrecks sit next to each other still today that you can visit. It's a great snorkeling spot for, you know, uh, novice divers and People just wanting to get out, free dive, snorkel, see shipwrecks. Uh, South Manitou Island is a place to go to start that. Here's a picture of that foggy day. You can see there's probably a couple hundred birds on it. And there are cormorants. And they use this 
shipwreck that sticks above the water, which is also unique to the Great Lakes. We don't have a lot of shipwrecks that still stick above the water. Um, the main reason is because any shipwreck that used to stick above the water has now been torn to pieces and flattened, uh, ripped apart, and now is underwater. The Francisco Morazan is somewhat protected from the north, which has the predominantly strong winds, which would bring the large ice sheets in. Since it's protected, uh, the superstructure still remains above the water. The bow over here is now underwater, and the stern is underwater. The stern broke off and went underwater uh, in our winter of 2014. We had a really cold winter, and the stern finally broke off the ship and sank underwater. This is a great site for anybody that would like to see shipwrecks. Here is a drone shot of the Morazan from above. You can see the stern over here and the bow and the superstructure still above the water. You can smell the shipwreck typically from a mile or two away. Uh, it's covered in bird poop and it's basically a bird sanctuary now. There's a lot of uh, birds that live on, on the wreck. The Morazan ran aground in South Manitou Shoal, November 29th, 1960. The Walter Frost was crushed as the Morazan hit in the same spot. Here's the bow of the Morazan that's now underwater. And this is the stern that broke off in 2014. Before 2014, um, the stern was well above the water and visible. And now it's just underwater. Um, it's, it's shallow here. It's probably only 17 feet deep total. So uh, you can easily snorkel this wreck if you'd like. This is inside the shipwreck. So I went inside to explore the engine room. And this is one of the water condensers. These are brass condensation tubes that are part of the boiler system that create the steam and pressure that once was used to propel the ship. Here's another part of that steam boiler. And the Walter Frost. The Walter Frost is the shipwreck that's about 150 feet away from the Francisco Morazan. This is the wreck that was ran over by the Francisco Morazan. The Walter Frost was lost on November 4th, 1903, after hitting the South Manitou Island Shoal. The Frost was carrying general merchandise. And you can see the Frost is stuck in the Frost. No pun intended. Um, there is ice all around it. And again, when the frost hit the shoal, the South Manitou Shoal, it became embedded in the ice and was pounded to pieces uh, within a year or two, it was underwater. Here is a overhead view from a drone of the Walter Frost. And I used drone to survey shipwreck sites. Uh, you can't always see the sites and these are just for shallow sites I use a drone for. But what this does is it shows, you can see the sand here starting to bury the shipwreck. So all this here, this light colored stuff is sand. And these are all ribs of the ship, the hull. Um, but you can see the sand is starting to cover the shipwreck again. And what happens is we have a lot of shifting sands in the Lilo County area. And there's a lot of shipwrecks that become buried and unburied over the years. And with a drone, I can survey much more of the site from above and watch things as they become unburied, uh, different pieces of the ship, possibly artifacts. Uh, so the drone is a very good tool for shipwreck hunting and documentation. This is the Walter Frost underwater. You can see the sand here and all of these stripes. They look like zebra stripes. These are the zebra mussels. The zebra mussels die and they become white and they fall off the um, shipwreck. And then they become part of the sand. And we have a very bad zebra mussel and quagga mussel problem here uh, in the Great Lakes. We're going to go to another spot that's not too far from South Manitou Island. It's called Pyramid Point. And this is the rising sun. The 
rising sun um, was used to bring people to High Island. High Island is an island that's right next to Beaver Island. It was once owned by the House of David out of Benton Harbor. And this is their religious group that once used the rising sun. And because of the shallow shoals, we have these rocky shoals. Uh, they're also called reefs. They're not coral reefs, but they're rocky reefs uh, in the Great Lakes. A lot of these ships would be would get caught in gale winds, which would make the ship, um, you know, go up and down a lot more in the waves. So anything that was shallow, there was a good chance, you know, that it was going to hit the bottom if they were blown into a shoal, just like the Walter Frost and the Frost and the Francisco Morazan. So this is a, a early picture of the rising sun shipwreck and the people came here to you know remove anything of value off the ship and standard practice back then was to uh, remove anything of value and basically let the ship just uh, disappear into the water here's what the rising sun looks like today this was the clearest day that i've ever seen uh, while snorkeling and scuba diving the shipwreck um, this is from last year typically in this area there's a lot of silt that's caused from the clay bottom there's a lot of clay in the bottom so when the waves uh, start pounding on the shoreline the silt gets stirred up and typically this site uh, the visibility uh, is still pretty good, but it's usually pretty silty. So this this particular day had been calm for multiple days, and the water is just crystal clear. You can see the prop here, and two of the prop blades are broke off. And over here where the cursor is, this is part of the old steam stacks and steam engine. The boilers in the background. Here is the side view of the rising sun. You can see the prop blade and, and, a, and a blade here is broke off. And I believe when it hit ground that two of the blades broke off. Some of the stuff uh, most likely was salvaged and I know it was prior to 1985 um, when the Michigan shipwreck laws were enacted, the Michigan bottomland laws that protected the shipwrecks. Before that, people would do uh, anything to these shipwrecks, they would get the wood, make tables. Um, there's actually a table that's been made uh, out of, I believe, the rudder of the rising sun that was removed when it was legal to do that. Um, but sometimes you can tell if things were actually broken off from an accident or they've been removed, uh, you know, through salvage. And, and you can see a clean break here. So it wasn't cut with a plasma welder or something they would have used back then, but um, plasma torch. So this wreck is visible from the bluffs of Pyramid Point. So if anybody ever visits Pyramid Point, it's a beautiful overlook. Um, if you just walk down to the west a little bit, you can look and see the shipwreck in the water. And here's the boiler. If you ever go to see the shipwreck, be careful because the boiler is about three feet underwater. And if you're not careful, your prop and lower unit would probably hit this boiler. Um, the water levels are very low right now. So this boiler is probably only a foot underwater currently. And if the water levels remain low, uh, these are navigational hazards that you should look out for, uh, especially if you're going to look for it and explore. This is the Alva Bradley. The Alva Bradley was one of the most beautiful schooners ever built in her time. And it was uh, one in a fleet of 200 schooners that were built for the Great Lakes. So these are some of the, this is one of the earliest schooners here. Um, Three-masted schooner. And it was a schooner barge and it was under tow at the time when the uh, ship sank, it was under tow. The rope had broke, it had been taken on water. A lot of these vessels start leaking over time. And this, this uh, schooner was leaking and it was under tow right near North Manitou Island. And it, the line broke uh, from the weight of the water pulling uh, the ship down. 
and the Alva Bradley sank. Today, this is what the Alva Bradley looks like. So what they call this is schooner fillet. And uh, schooners sometimes will open up on the bottom and the hull and the sides will just open up and lay down flat. And using the drone, you can get a good overlook of the site. Uh, this site actually looks like the site that was documented back in 1991 when uh, a lot of these shipwrecks were um, documented into a book. So this wreck here hasn't changed much, but it used to have uh, all these beautiful artifacts, these um, big stars, these metal stars and, and different various things that uh, it was shipping. And a lot of that's been taken and salvaged over the years. Um, so there's not a lot of artifacts left on it because it's a shallow wreck. So a lot of the deeper wrecks still have that, but it's a shallow wreck. So a lot of it's been salvaged. And as you can see, this is this is a picture here. Uh, this is 30 feet deep, and this is how clear water is. Um, the water was so clear when I was there, I basically just dipped my camera into the water off the back of my boat and took this picture. Um, you can see where the cursor is here. This is the rudder. The rudder is, is nestled in here between the hull and <clears throat> other parts of the shipwreck. And you can see these these pieces here, these are the knees. The knees are what used to hold up the top deck and haul together, structurally reinforce the vessel. This is an artifact. Very rare to see an artifact on the Alva Bradley, but I noticed something that looked like wood um, just under the sand and we just brushed the sand off to see what it was. And this is a dead eye. A dead eye is made out of the hardest and strongest wood in the world. And it's lingam vitae, it's called. And the wood is very resistant to heat and corrosion. So the ropes would go through these notches and, and this big bolt here would be holding the dead eye to the ship. And the ropes would go through this and hold the sails up. And the, the dead eye can take excessive heat from the ropes burning through it, and it doesn't wear it down. And lingam vitae is a mangrove style wood that's harvested in Florida and other places in the world. And at the peak of shipbuilding time in the late 1800s, um, it was getting over harvested. And this type of wood was almost uh, almost went extinct because of the uh, demand for it and all the ships that were getting built. And we don't remove or touch any artifacts. This stayed right where it was in the sand for other divers to see. And this is another shipwreck right near the Alva Bradley. So near the Alva Bradley, there's three shipwrecks by it. And it's on this place called Donner Point. And Donner Point is one of my favorite places to go and visit when I visit North Manitou Island. It's beautiful dunes, similar to the Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes, just on a smaller scale. And uh, just amazing beaches. North Manitou Island that has these shipwrecks around it also has some of the oldest uh, white cedar trees in the United States, um, 300 to 500 year old trees. And you can still see them today. If anybody goes out to North Manitou Island, <clears throat> it's well, I'm sorry, that's on South Manitou Island, the trees, but a North had it as well. Um, so on these islands, there's a lot of ships that would come and, and pick up lumber and they were heavily harvested for their lumber and the white cedar and different trees that were of high value were almost harvested completely off the islands. Now, there's a place on South Manitou Island called Valley of the Giants that's full of these old white cedar trees, and they are some of the oldest trees, white cedar trees in the United States. And the reason that in this particular area, the trees were not harvested is because the sand would blow off the dunes into the tree bark, and the lumberjacks couldn't cut the trees down because it would dull the blades too much. 
So that's another reason why we have a lot of shipwrecks around these islands, because there was a lot of ships coming and going from the different ports and docks. This is an unidentified shipwreck on North Manitou Island. It still today has not been identified. This is what it looks like underwater. It's a fairly large ship. So there are shipwrecks still today that have been unidentified or not identified. Um, reason being because there's not a lot to go off of to identify these wrecks. They've been smashed to pieces by ice and weather over the years. And it's hard to match them up with any existing uh, information on ships. This is the George Rogers. This is the shipwreck. The first, this is the ship that I took videos and pictures of for the first time uh, I ever, you know, was doing the shipwreck photography. So this is the George Rogers back in, you know, early 1900s. And it was just a small steamer. And this is the George Rogers today. I still haven't released the coordinates of the George Rogers. And I will soon. Um, it's in front of private property and it's kind of a hard area to access. It's very shallow water. And the George Rogers um, is an important shipwreck in Leelanau County. And I will be releasing the coordinates for that soon. I just didn't want a lot of people uh, up on a private shore trying to see the shipwreck. So I haven't released the coordinates for it yet, but I believe I am one of the only people that has the coordinates for it because it was located while I was paddle boarding. Here's more parts of the George Rogers. Uh, there is no prop. I was told by a local uh, Leland County member that the prop, was, the prop was removed in the 1960s. And then since then it had been long forgotten and there's never been any pictures and video of this shipwreck uh, until, you know, I got to it on a paddleboard and, and took videos and pictures. There's still a lot left to see on the shipwreck. So here's the boiler of the George Rogers. And the boiler of the George w Rogers was removed in the late 70s, I believe. And it was put on a barge. And I heard the story that a gentleman was going to take the boiler back to Northport, which you have to go around uh, Northport Point. It's kind of a long boat ride towing a barge um, about a mile, mile and a half from the George Rogers. The boiler had fallen off the barge. The wind had picked up. Um, and it's such a large boiler that the guy that salvaged it ended up just leaving it there. And it's there today. And this is right near Peterson Park on a calm day. You can see the boiler from the bluffs of Peterson Park. It looks like a big boulder, but it's the George Rogers boiler. Also looks like a robot head, um, a lot of people think. So it's, it's pretty cool. This is the Westmoreland. The Westmoreland, in my opinion, is the most famous treasure ship in all the Great Lakes. You know, a lot of people talk and know about the Edmunds Fitzgerald. Um, the Edmunds Fitzgerald became very well known and prominent because of the wealthy people that were associated with the, sh with the ship. And a song was made about it you know, a famous song that everybody's heard about the Fitzgerald. Um, but there's a lot of shipwrecks out there that not as many people know about that are just equally important, uh, if not more important. Uh, now, the Westmoreland here sank on December 7th, 1854. Um, and this, this picture of the ship isn't the picture of the Westmoreland. This is the closest thing I could find. Uh, there is no known pictures of the Westmoreland online, but this is a similar ship. You can see the hogging arches here. The hogging arches are still intact on the Westmoreland, which makes it very unique as well. The upper uh, cabin here is not on the vessel anymore. And what happens is the air gets trapped in these ships and when they sink so fast, the upper cabin portions get pulled off the wreck and float away. Um, 
and just kind of break apart. So what we're going to see is the main deck and the hogging arches and some other various important parts of the ship. Bound from Chicago to Fort Mac with whiskey and gold and winter provisions. It was headed to supply the garrison stationed in Fort Mac during the Civil War. And it was rumored to have the pay for the garrison army, which was around 10,000 gold eagle coins, valued anywhere from 10 to $20 million today. Also within it was 280 barrels of whiskey. And also just winter provisions and stuff for the, the men on the island and on Fort Mac, Mackinac Island. Um, it did not make it. And I heard that that year was one of the hardest winters that anybody has ever seen before. You know, the soldiers uh, out in Fort Mac because this vessel did not arrive with um, the whiskey and winter provisions that they needed so much. 17 lives were lost on this ship. 17 made it to shore in a lifeboat. Only one lifeboat made it to shore. And everyone that made it to shore, I believe 19 people made it to shore. Two people perished uh, from hypothermia and cold weather exposure when they made it to shore. The remaining 17 had to walk almost 40 miles to the nearest town at the time of Manistee. And to tell the story of the Westmoreland. Now, Ross Richardson, a local here around Traverse City, local wreck hunter, uh, located the shipwreck in 2010. Uh, many, many wreck hunters were trying to find this treasure ship because of the rumors of the contents of what it had in it. It would have been uh, very lucrative for them to find it and salvage it, but nobody could find it until 2010. The shipwreck laws have already been enacted by, the, enacted by then, and Ross has kept the location private and has only given out coordinates to uh, people that he's invited and people that he uh, trusts to be on the rock because there's a lot of artifacts and it's a pretty sensitive site. It's also very deep. It's 195 feet deep to the sand. It's not buoyed, so we don't want people anchoring into the ship. Um, we don't want people deploying... Uh, any buoy systems around this ship, you know, maybe damaging the wheel or the life boat davits or the hogging arches. Uh, so it's just an old precious vessel that um, not many people get to see. And I was fortunate enough to, to be invited to go, um, you know, take some photos down here and dive it. Here is the anchor hanging off the bow of the Westmoreland. And you can see it's completely encapsulated with zebra and quagga mussels. That's what all these little mussels are here. All these little shells. Um, almost every square inch of the ship is encapsulated with them. Here's the hogging arches. So this is looking down towards uh, the bow from the stern towards the bow. As we make our way, it was a 200 foot long ship. And I was able to explore most of it in a nice long dive. You can see the hogging arches here. And there's a chain that hangs in between both of them as a structural support as well. Also, as you can see down here, there's artifacts. So these are some ornate artifacts that lay on the deck. And... Another reason that Ross would like to keep it private for now, because until, you know, it's, it's buoyed properly and um, there's more eyes on it for, to protect it. We'd like to just keep everything as is. Here's a close up of the artifacts. You can see the ornate water jug and the plate that used to sit in also the holder as well. And inside of the ship, you know, um, there's most likely muskets, um, you know, for the for the soldiers and, and all kinds of stuff that was getting shipped from Chicago to Fort Mac. And everything's still on this ship. And a lot of people probably just recently saw this on the news 
um, it, it, it went viral. It was on uh, the UK Daily Mail and it made it all the way. Uh, I believe Forbes magazine shared a, a post about it. Um, so a lot of people have been talking about the shipwreck. There's a, a permit that's about to get uh, filled out to possibly remove some of the whiskey barrels, uh, artifacts and gold would go into a museum. We have a local museum here in Empire that would be a great place for some of these artifacts, but it has to be done legally. So there's a lot of paperwork that has to be done, um, whether it's granted or not, you know, who knows, but um, the ship is deteriorating. And at some point, uh, all these artifacts and everything on there are gonna be lost in the big pile of debris. This is the Westmoreland Stern as I start to make my ascent back to the surface. And we're gonna go up to the Fox Islands. So this is the Fletcher by South Fox Island. Now South Fox Island is 25 miles from Leland and 19 miles north of North Manitou Island. There's a series of islands that start at Beaver Island and go all the way down to the Manitous. And the Fox Islands are within those island, that island chain there. Um, a lot of shipwrecks around the Fox Islands. The Fox Islands had shoals that went out way out from the island, probably a mile and a half. And the gale winds would pick up and the ships would try to come out of the Manitou Passage and get into a safe refuge and they would be pounded to pieces by the large rocks that you can see uh, here and in different places here. Um, so again, the drone is a great tool to use while exploring uh, for shipwrecks. I didn't have the coordinates for the shipwreck and I, I knew about where it was because I had been to it before. I just didn't save the coordinates at the time but I flew my drone up about 500 feet and could easily see the shipwreck and the boiler. Here's the shipwreck, uh, one part of it. So the shipwrecks, there's three different areas of it, a boiler and two larger parts of the wreck. You can see the water is just crystal clear. This is early season, great time to be out. Uh, you can see the, the size of the boiler. Uh, my boat there is 19 feet long and the boiler is almost as big as my boat. Uh, it's not quite 19 feet long, but it's definitely around 12 feet long. And you can see the boiler on Google Earth. Um, I will be showing everyone how to locate some of these vessels and with coordinates as well on Google Earth. And we're going to do another uh, little seminar about that. Um, so I'm out just exploring. I was actually out by myself this day. Um, Sometimes I go out and and do these explorations. A lot of time, times uh, Milo will come with me, my, my pug. I got a pug. Uh, he loves going out for boat rides and, and getting in the water and all that. Um, so he loves going out on some of these shipwreck adventures. One second here. This is the James McBride. The James McBride becomes buried and unburied, like I was describing earlier, in the sand. Um, this shipwreck is just off of Sleeping Bear Point, and it sank in the late 1800s. And it's also around several other wrecks and I'm not going to go over every shipwreck in Leelanau County because there's so many and it would take too long. I'd like to cover uh, some of the other larger, deeper shipwrecks that I've been exploring in other areas of the Great Lakes as well. So um, the James McBride was an important ship in our area at the time and there's not much left of it. You can see the sand is almost completely buried the wreck and I wanted to share this just because there's a lot of shipwrecks that become visible and then the next year they're completely gone and they might be gone for 20 30 years before they uncover again so getting these pictures and documenting these wrecks is very important to uh, just maintain 
you know, our history of these wrecks. This is the Vega, North Manitou Island. And the Vega was a steel freighter that, you know, got caught in a gale wind again and blew up on a shoal. Now, here's pieces of the Vega. You can see the steel here is just torn. The steel, it's really thick. It's it's almost an inch thick. It's three quarters inch thick, I think. Um, the ice sheets come in, and there's a lot of centrifugal force behind the ice sheets. So this particular rack most likely was sticking out of the water. Uh, it's in 30 feet deep of water. So the top of it was probably still sticking above the water. The ice sheets come in and totally shear off everything of the rack. Um, Right now, it's pretty much a debris field. You can also see the outline of this shipwreck from Google Earth. This is the windlass here. And you can see some of the parts and pieces, but things are pretty hard to distinguish on what they are. The Vega foundered in South Box Island, November 29th, 1905, in Gale Winds, while carrying iron ore. So iron ore was and coal were two things that were shipped a lot in the Great Lakes. They were used in our industry and also to heat homes. The iron ore was used for the steel. Uh, we get a lot of iron ore from up north in the Keweenaw Peninsula, a lot of mines up there. So a lot of these vessel, vessels would go get the iron ore and they would bring it back down to more industrialized areas like Chicago and Detroit, New York, uh, various ports like that, that would take the iron ore for our manufacturing industries. This is the Grace Williams. The Grace Williams was used to salvage other shipwrecks until it became a shipwreck itself. So the Grace Williams, um, there's not a lot of people that have been, the, been on the Grace Williams. It's another wreck that's not publicly disclosed the coordinates and it's very deep. It's 204 feet deep. It's the small rabbit steamer. And a rabbit steamer is basically a steamer that's kind of made uh, maybe in a pole barn or in someone's private property with the materials and building practices that whatever the captain uh, had at the time that was going to use to build it. So the rabbit steamer is basically a mutant steamer uh, ship that wasn't built with uh, in a shipbuilding yard with traditional building practices always. Um, so we call them rabbit steamers. And here's the steam stack. This is the bow of the ship. And you can see one mast here laying on the side. And here is the anchor. You can see here it's totally encapsulated with zebra mussels. This is another unknown shipwreck. The shipwreck was located by Brendan Ballard with Google Earth. Google Earth Pro is used because they have this thing called time machine and you can rewind the time and the pictures that were taken from the satellite and find calmer days to find underwater anomalies. When you see an underwater anomaly, it's not always a shipwreck, but quite often it is. So this shipwreck's 30 feet deep. You can see it on Google Earth. Um, Typically, when you see something that's in the shape of a ship through Google Earth or drone footage, a lot of times it is. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just clay mounds and different underwater, uh, you know, geology features that might resemble a shipwreck. But this, in fact, was a shipwreck. This is the first picture ever taken of the shipwreck. Um, we call it fish bones. It's the nickname we gave it because it looks like a giant fish fillet. Uh, it was definitely salvaged at one time, and it looks like it was built in the late 1800s. Um, again, another rabbit steamer, a small steamer. At times, we thought that this might also be a vessel that was used by the House of David um, that owned the Rising Sun. They had several ships that they had uh, in their little fleet. And this may have been another vessel that was used by the House of David, but we're not sure. Um, there's no 
known shipwrecks that have the same dimensions and, and build. So it's it's a to this day unknown shipwreck that was found by Brendan Ballad. He gave me the coordinates for it, and I went out to take pictures and, and make sure it was a shipwreck. This is the Congress. The Congress was used to haul lumber, a lot of that white cedar that was getting harvested, uh, over harvested. They almost harvested every single tree off the islands. And the Congress was used to come and go a lot from South Manitou Island and bring the lumber off it. The Congress caught fire. in October 5th, 1904, and it was pushed off the dock at South Manitou Island to burn, and it burned down to the waterline. As you can see, the stern uh, is completely gone. It sank, and it's in 160 feet deep of water in the middle of South Manitou Harbor, and it's not really a harbor, but it's called a harbor because it's a moon-shaped area protected by wind but there is no moored boats or docks other than the dock for the National Park Service that operates out of there. This is what the bow looks like today. The fire burned the entire uh, cabin and top deck and the water is silty here because again, it has that clay on the bottom. And this is kind of the silt that I was talking about. Here's a side view of the bow. You can see this. there's an anchor right here, old big woodstock anchor mixed into a bunch of old ropes and chains. Uh, the windlass is down here as well. One of the points of interest of this wreck is the tall uh, steam engines. And you can actually swim right through them here. Um, the points of interest on the wreck are gonna be the bow with the anchor, the windlass and the chains and the steam engine and the boilers are right down here. I love taking pictures of lighthouses. Um, lighthouses are very important into our shipping uh, history because they protected ships from a lot of these shoals. Now this lighthouse in particular is in the Straits of Mackinac. So we're gonna kind of move from Leelanau County to the Straits of Mackinac here and this shoal is 20 miles west of the Mackinac Bridge. And it's many miles offshore and you can see how shallow it is. So if there was a big ship coming through, they would never know that the shoal was there. It's called White Shoal. And two to three wrecks uh, wrecked on this shoal. And then the White Shoal light was built to help ships safely navigate around White Shoal. This is some drone footage and you can see the stars in the window. So the stars in the window are unique because they're only in there um, in, during winter. It's to protect the windows during winter. Um, the stars are removed in spring and I go out real early season and explore these places because the clarity of the water and it's usually calm in the spring. We've had very windy summers. So the best time for diving, the clarity is in early spring. And then the algae blooms start to happen towards the end of June and July. And by August, uh, there's quite a bit of algae in the water. So I get out when it's cold and early. And that's when I can get some of the, the best photos too. Uh, this is one of my favorite shipwrecks. This is the Cedarville. The Cedarville was wrecked on May 7th, 1965 after a collision with the Topps Dallas Ford with 10 lives lost. So the Cedarville was hit so hard in its side, it was T-boned by the Topps Dallas Ford and sank and 10 people died within it. Now what's unique about this ship is that it's also claimed the lives of 10 divers. So there's over, 20 there's 20 people that have died in this ship here um and it's it's almost haunting on the bottom 
uh, as you can see here, that's upside down. So it landed upside down and it's 601 feet long. So this is one of the biggest shipwrecks in the Great Lakes and, and it's not far from the Mackinac Bridge. It's only about a mile west of the bridge, um, straight out from the middle of the bridge. And what happens is the divers go down and it's 110 feet deep to the bottom. So you're about 100 feet deep uh, while visiting the wreck. And a lot of novice divers will go in these doors. They'll go in different areas here and they'll get lost inside because it's an upside down dark labyrinth, upside down doorways and stairways, uh, very easy to get turned around and disoriented. And the divers run out of air and never come out. Um, all the bodies have been recovered of the divers that have died inside. Um, I don't believe all the bodies uh, of the sailors have been recovered. Um, it's a wreck that I'll be exploring for many years. I've been inside this wreck. Um, I've been warned about the dangers inside the wreck and I actually got caught inside the wreck myself uh, as a highly trained diver. I got snagged inside um, in the engine room and kept calm. Uh, the best thing to do is keep calm when something like that happens. And I was able to free myself and get myself out of the wreck. But a uh, very dangerous wreck to go into, and I'm going to continue to explore it, but you have to be very careful. There's a lot of conduits and wires that hang, and if it gets snagged in your gear, um, sometimes it's really hard to get out. Here's the pilot house upside down. There's Lee Rosenberg, one of my dive partners, does the lighting for me, lighting up the pilot house. So here's some pictures inside the engine room. And this is where I got stuck on a wire um, right after I took these pictures. And you can see all the different gauges and stuff. You can still read the numbers on them. Um, inside the rack, it's protected from uh, the muscles don't really go in there as much. And the silt um, from outside the ship doesn't come in as much. So if you're a good diver and you have good buoyancy and trim, you can navigate around without stirring the silt up and still see all this stuff just like it was. Uh, you know, these are different computers, early, early computers. Uh, you know, this is 1960s here. There's a lot to see. There's many rooms that I haven't explored yet, but uh, this engine room I got into this year. You can see a telephone here. Uh, very rare to see a telephone on a shipwreck. Um, here's the call box. So you would actually crank that there and, and make a call um, from the engine room, which was in the stern. And the call would be made 600 feet ahead to the pilot house to talk to the captain uh, back and forth. They would use these phones. Here's the stern. So I entered down here through a doorway and went into the engine room. This is the Eber Ward. This is one of the most well-known shipwrecks in the Straits of Mackinac. The ward hit a large ice sheet while transiting the Straits of Mackinac on April 20th, 1909. The ship sank in minutes. Five of the crew were pulled down with it. This ship was carrying corn that was later salvaged uh, through a lot of painstaking process over the next year after it sank. So a lot of the corn was removed out of it. And you can see where the ice hit right here. This is a huge hole. It's probably 15 to 18 feet long and about six feet tall. And you can actually see right through to the other side. So what happened is the bow is very strong. When the bow hit the ice sheet, the ice punched in both sides and the bow itself did not break, but the hull caved in on the sides from the ice, sank within minutes. Unique feature of this is the mushroom anchor here and two other anchors on the top. Here's a very clear picture. So here's an anchor and the second anchor here and the mushroom anchor. Uh, it's not often that ships had mushroom anchors um, on them. They didn't do a whole lot because they would drag, but this ship had the mushroom anchor, which makes it unique 
and that's a point of interest that I like to see you when I dive it. Here's the stern. This is one of the first shots I ever took with my professional camera. This is probably five years ago. I took the shot and again, the water clarity was just fantastic. 34 degree water, low particulate, not much algae, uh, over a hundred foot visibility. And you can see how large the ship was. It was 213 feet long and 37 feet tall. So over three stories tall. We went inside, explored the hole inside of the ship, both levels. Uh, you can see the burbot here that Lee Rosenberg's lighting up. The burbot like to swim around. Uh, they don't really bother us. They, they love to stir up the silt for my shots. So best thing is to get in there and get your shots as fast as possible because there's so many burbot inside the shipwreck. We call it the burbot hotel. And there was probably a hundred burbot that were inside this ship. And they kind of just float around, check out. And you can see the boiler here and some of the old boiler valves. So here's one of the burbot. You can see the color and design on it. And it's kind of like half fish, half eel. And it has this big long whisker that hangs off its chin. So this whisker comes off its chin. The eyes are opaque. It doesn't have good vision at all. Um, it hunts like for crayfish and anything that will move uh, different bottom feeders. And it strikes um, when a crayfish or something gets close to it. And it can feel and sense that with the whisker. Uh, that's how the burbot hunt. Very unique fish to the Great Lakes. We see them almost in every shipwreck. They love to hang out in shipwrecks. Here's inside of the Eberward. You can see the big machinery used to unload and load the corn and different things that it would carry. Now we're going to go to my favorite place to dive in the Great Lakes is in Presque Isle, uh, Presque Isle, Michigan. A lot of people don't realize there's two Presque Isles. So we have one in Marquette. And we have one uh, Presque Isle County, which is just north of Alpena. Uh, very busy shipping lane as well through there. A lot of places coming and going from Detroit and then up through the Straits, back down to Chicago. Um, this is this is you know what I would call a ghost ship. Uh, this is the Cornelia B. Windia. She sank on November 27th, 1875 with all lives lost. The ship, which was designed to carry 16,000 bushels of grain, was overloaded to 21,000 bushels. And because of greed and basically, you know, just the, the people in charge wanted more money, so they'd overload these vessels by quite a bit. And as soon as they encountered winter storms or any kind of gale winds, uh, vessels could not keep above water and they would sink, um, you know, due to overloading. Uh, the prominent theory of how this sank, and I believe it as well, is that uh, on November 20th, 1875, there was a very strong winter storm that was recorded and is well known. And we believe that the ship became completely encapsulated with freezing uh, from freezing spray. So it was encapsulated in ice and the ice was so thick that it weighed the ship down even more. And since the ship was already overloaded, the ice slowly pulled it down to the bottom of Lake Huron. And also why we believe that is because the lifeboat is here. The lifeboat ropes are still here and you can still see the lifeboat uh, <clears throat> connection points that it used to hang from. So the pulleys that were on there are still in the bow and stern of the lifeboat. And all of the artifacts were basically still in place when this vessel was found. So the only way that that would have happened was that is everybody would have been probably froze to death and they would have been pushed off the boat because it was very slippery, covered in ice. So the sailors were, were, uh, knocked off the boat from the storm and it very well could have continued to sail for an unknown amount of miles until it was completely 
encapsulated with ice so thick that it was pulled to the bottom. And since the artifacts were all on the deck and in various places in the cabin, very particular, uh, peculiar um, how the artifacts were, we believe that they were all frozen in ice and the ice thawed after it slowly sank to the bottom and everything was in place as it was before it went down. And the lifeboat sits next to it, so it was never deployed. So these are all little clues to why the Cornelia B. Windy it sank. This is one of my favorite pictures that I captured of the Cornelia B. Windy it. Uh, you can see the lifeboat here. And this is Meredith Hogue, another uh, <clears throat> part of my dive team that I dive with. We do a lot of deep technical diving. And here's the wheel. And you can see the rudder here. And we got this, Meredith wanted to try to get the shot. So this is a choreographed shot that we talked about before I went down. Uh, here's a, another shot. Uh, Lee Rosenberg is, is in here, shining a light through the cabin. And Mike Rill, another uh, amazing technical diver that I dive with, is illuminating the pulley. And, and Mike is really good at showing other divers, including myself, um, artifacts and different things that you might not see normally. Uh, he's been diving longer than me, and it's great to have him on the team when we dive together because he shows us so many different things that normal people wouldn't see. So you can see the pulley block down there still attached to the lifeboat. The Cornelia B. Windy, it's 180 feet deep, freezing cold water. The water temperature in Lake Huron at this depth is 38 degrees year round. Here's a picture of the wheel, it's Meredith, with some other divers here. Here's the lifeboat. You can see the ribs even in the lifeboat. I do a lot of shots with multi-spectrum lights. Uh, Lee has a wide beam, Meredith has a, a spot. We like to combine the beams of light and set things up various ways to create unique pictures, unlike a lot of other people. Uh, so we kind of make our own um, shots in doing this. I try not to copy other people and how I put together uh, my shipwreck photos. I, I like to be unique and original. So uh, we have multiple different techniques that we use to get some of these fantastic shots. This is the Norman. The Norman, prior to her sinking, was a great ship. You can see the mass, uh, early construction. This is when the old ships still had mass at the time. Uh, some, some of these are, are, are used for unloading as well. Um, and you can see the steam stack in the back. So this is the Norman today. The Norman was in a violent collision with the freighter Jack. As Lee lights up the anchor that has been hanging off the bow since 1895. So the Norman got hit by the uh, Jack of Kingston. It's a Canadian ship and sank with three lives lost. The Jack saved the remaining crew off the Norman and it's at 200 feet deep in Presque Isle. You can see here the anchor and hull. This is Meredith and this is Liz Pepin up here. She's from Marquette, another uh, diver that we dive with a lot. And here's Lee Rosenberg with his wide angle light. This is a choreographed shot that we planned out before we went down. And as you can see, I can change up the shot and make a totally different shot with the same people in different positions uh, with just different lighting angles. So we really captured it here. Um, this massive anchor is much larger than Lee. And you can change the shot dramatically just by changing your position of the light and the position of my body. So this is, this is probably the best shot that I took of 2023. Here's the stern of the Norman. And in here is the engine room. We went inside the engine room. This is where the steam stack was connected to. It's laying on the ground now. 
This is where where my cursor is. This is where the jack hit the Norman and broke it in two. This is Liz checking out the collision area. Here's Lee and Liz in the background. Uh, this is the lifeboat. The lifeboat still has the oars in it, which are very unique, something you don't normally see. So the lifeboat was tied to uh, the Norman, and over the years it slowly fell off the side and rested on the bottom with the oars still in it. Here's a picture of the cargo hold of the Norman, one of the mast or cargo and loading poles, and here's Lee illuminating the stern of the lifeboat. This is inside the engine room. These are some of the boiler gauges. And right here, it's hard to see, but there's actually a hat from one of the sailors that died. His hat is stuck on what looks like to me is a solenoid. And you can see the hat here still today. This is the telegraph. This is what was used before they had a phone like I showed in the Cedarville. So the engine room would watch this. This was moved from the pilot house and it would tell the engine room what to do. And as you can see the writing on here. Um, it would tell you, you know, to go forward or reverse, things like that. Here's another side image of it. Now this is another uh, rack that's in Presque Isle in Lake Huron. Um, this, sorry. Can't read the top of my page here, but uh, this, this shipwreck sank on October 20th, 1854 while carrying railroad iron after colliding with the Defiance. So on the sides of this rack are all old railroad iron, which is very unique. I don't normally see that. Here's the anchor and all the railroad iron on the sides. Here's Liz and Lee illuminating some stuff. Here's the old mass on here and a bunch of railroad iron that's on there. And inside you can see in the storage hall and the cargo hold here, all the railroad iron that's still in there and it's starting to rust. Here's the wheel, the wheels sitting here in the deck broken off. And here is a whiskey jug. It's never good when you see a wheel next to a whiskey jug. <laughs> Here's one of the railroad irons stuck into the bottom. This is the Kyle Spangler. She sank after a collision with the schooner Racine, November 7th, 1860. You can see the mast still stand tall and the cross trees are still on there. The Kyle Spangler engraved into the side. Here's another picture of the Woodstock anchor and the mast that stand tall. This is one of the most intact canal schooners in the world next to the Cornelia B. Windiot. This is the collision area where the Racine had a head-on collision and sank the Spangler. Here's the wheel. It was carrying 16,000 bushels of wheat. We're almost done here with the presentation. This is one of my favorite wrecks in Presque Isle. This is the Florida. 1890, just a massive ship. So the Florida was the second largest wooden steamship ever built in its time. And it was sank by the largest steamship in her time, the George Roby. The Florida is a wooden package freighter that sank on May 21st, 1897. She was in a collision with the larger George Roby and sank within minutes. The crew was saved by the George Roby. So nobody died on this ship. Um, the George Roby actually sank another ship two years later and was at fault both times going too fast for conditions and fog. This shipwreck is littered with artifacts. It has the most artifacts of any wreck, I would say, in the Great Lakes because it was a package freighter that had, it was like a giant FedEx truck. Um, and it sank so fast that nothing was removed off of it. Here's Mike illuminating the capstan. 
And this is 204 feet deep. This is inside. So these are old barrels that were most likely filled with whiskey or different oils. And I say that because you can see the barrel uh, band still, still in the debris pile here. These are all barrel slats. Behind this big pile here and over here, uh, you can still see the barrels. These are This is flour that used to be in barrels. It's now like this gelatinous um, material that's in the ship. You can hear me racking off some pictures here. I, I do video as well. So here is the picture from that video. And Mike's illuminating down here is the bell of the ship. Not a lot of people know the bell is right there. It's in a in the pile. Um, this ship hit so hard on the bottom that it, it busted the whole stern off and the engine rolled right out. Here's a barrel inside of it. Still intact. Who knows what's inside of it? Here's the collision spot where the Roby hit the Florida. Here's a crate that's broken apart. You can see all these old teapots. One of the things that was getting shipped at the time. There's a lot of stoves. This is a tool chest. Um, there's all kinds of pots and pans and stoves, lanterns, you know, anything that needed to be shipped at the time. Here's a lantern. This is an old lantern, red glass lantern here. Now these are barrels that are stuck to the top of the ship. This is the only time I've ever seen this. Uh, these slats are slowly falling off the barrels and leaving behind most likely flour um, that's all kind of coagulated together. And now is this gelatinous blob um, stuck to the ceiling. So the barrels floated to the ceiling because they had some air in it when it sank. And the barrels have been stuck to the ceiling since it sank in the 1800s. Here's a bunch of barrels that were stuck to the ceiling. All the slats had fallen off that are on the, on the deck now. Um, and it looks like a bunch of burnt marshmallows. Um, <laughs> you can see a slat still here, but most of the slats had fallen off. So what happened was, is the water absorbed into the barrels because the pressure, they were full of flour that had air in it. So it was aerated and the pressure finally pushed the water through. The water uh, got the flour wet, expanded, and it started knocking the slats off. Here's the pressure gauges on the engine. And so for shipwrecks, uh, that's just a fraction of, of what I've been on. I've been on hundreds of shipwrecks. And if anybody wants to see any more of those, they can go to my, my page on Facebook and check that out. I share pictures all the time of those. Um, I wanted to, to real quickly touch base on some of the geology dives that I do. I love doing geology dives. And uh, this is a sinkhole that we went into this year. It's called the Middle Island Sinkhole. And this is just north of Alpena off of Rockport, off of Middle Island. It's 75 feet deep. Here's the edge of it. And it has unique hot spots of biochemical activity at several submerged groundwater vents. And this is in Lake Huron. So on the bottom of it, there's vents that push water out that have uh, a lot of tannins and stuff in it. And it's a... Uh, low oxygen water that creates these purple algae mats that are unique to this area. Uh, not a lot of places you can see this, but you can see the bright purple algae that's growing here. So groundwater coming in from the sinkholes contains high sulfate and low dissolved oxygen, which makes this unique environment, this purple algae grows. These spectacular purple mats are created by photosynthetic cyan bacteria. Here's some of the, this is Liz and Lee looking for groundwater vents. And these vents are all around here with these little purple around them here. Here's a vent. You can see the algae that's growing around it. And you can actually see the water kind of coming out of it. Very unique area. The Great Lakes supply millions of people with fresh water. We should all try and protect them from pollution and invasive species. Um, I, I do plastic pollution awareness. I am a, a advocate for keeping the Great Lakes clean. I like to clean up 
the shorelines, any plastics and garbage so it doesn't go into our waters. And I also do uh, removal in water that I'm pretty well known for. Uh, I was published in Outside Magazine last year as a protector of the Great Lakes for my plastics pollution work that I do. This is a picture of Spray Falls in Munising, Michigan. This is in Lake Superior. So we also have amazing geology that you can go in caves on Lake Superior and different calcite veins in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, all super interesting. I, I, I love to you know see this stuff. So when I go out and look for shipwrecks, I'm also uh, photographing geology and you know anything that's interesting like that. Uh, and it all has to do with history of our world. Um, this place here, this is the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, this is along the Mid-Continent Rift. The Mid-Continent Rift uh, opened up millions of years ago, and that's what created the Keweenaw Peninsula. And so this is all actual lava. It's called basalt. Uh, so the lava boiled out of the Earth's crust, and it was superheated, and it created crystals. Uh, this is um, a vein. This is one of the largest veins I've ever seen of calcite and quartz. There's uh, gold and silver that's in it. The miners used to mine this. That's why there's so many mines in the Kiwana Peninsula. But underwater, it's untouched because the miners didn't get to it. So we would explore uh, these different veins. You can see this large chunk of calcite crystal here. And this crystal clear water, again, early season. This is Lake Superior. I just wanted to show people that I do more than just shipwrecks. Um, I'm very interested in geology and the history of our area. And also, just please help keep our waters clean. Uh, this is from one dive that I did in Traverse City uh, after the Cherry Festival. And all this stuff uh, came out of the water. This is one, one dive. I removed all this garbage. And these are Mylar balloons. This is actually a weather balloon, but mylar balloons, uh, please don't let them go. They end up in the Great Lakes. I find them all the time floating in the water. Thank you for coming to my presentation. This is Fox Island, one of my favorite places to spend my time. So if anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Chris. Um, yeah, please put your questions in the Q and A. Um, and I will. Um, I noticed one that I think is pretty uh, foundational to a lot of what you talked about as well. Someone asked, "Is the Francisco Morazon considered part of the National Lakeshore?" And this kind of goes into to all the shipwrecks. Um, and I can kind of start the answer to this one. But they're um, because they're on the bottom lands of of the lake. They're held in public trust by the state of Michigan. So they're all historic and cultural um, resources that are protected by the state so that we can all enjoy them and, and see these great photos that Chris captures. Did you have anything to add to that, Chris? Um, yeah, no, you you nailed it for sure. So it's it's part of it, you know, in, in a sense, but it is mainly part of the bottom land. So Mm -hmm. yeah. um, someone asks, are there any, is there anybody in the area running dive charters? I think they've, you've piqued a lot of curiosity of people who want to <laughs> want to get underwater now. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we only have a, a few different charters in, in the state of Michigan. Uh, we used to have charters in this area in the Manitou Passage, Traverse City. Uh, we do not have charters here now. Um, so a lot of this, you, you know, have to get someone that knows has a boat or rent a boat to get out to these locations. But if anybody's interested in seeing any of this stuff, the shallow, a lot of shallow stuff in this area, um, please just get a hold of me. I'll give you the coordinates for everything that I got and also give you advice on how to navigate these waters. Uh, we have a lot of shallow shoals and stuff, as I talked about during the presentation. Um, but yeah, there's no charters here, but if you know someone with a boat or can acquire a boat, I can definitely help you get to many of the sites here. Um, for those who are really curious about seeing the shipwrecks up close to just walking the beaches in um, Sleepy Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, you're often going to 
see pieces or even a shipwreck. And there is um, a way to report those pieces to the state of Michigan. And that's something, especially through this winter, when you get big storms and wave action, very often pieces will wash up. Um, and Elizabeth, my coworker, can post that in the, the chat of how you report that to the state. There's a state archaeologist who, who kind of inventories all of these uh, ships and um, artifacts that wash up and keeps track of things. Um, someone asked, Chris, is uh, this your only job? No. Um, so I'm a master electrician, electrical contractor, and I've been doing that for over 20 years now. And I run an electrical contracting company in Traverse City and have multiple employees. And we do a large amount of work here locally and in Leelanau County. Um, I'm also an author, so I, I wrote a shipwreck book. It's called Leelanau Underwater. It's my first book. I'm going to do a series of different uh, areas throughout the Great Lakes. I'm working on my second book right now, The Straits of Mackinac Underwater. Um, there's still several shipwrecks that I have to dive. It's been a windy year, so I wasn't able to do that. And so I also do do this. Uh, I sell my photography. So I, I have three three jobs that I do. Um, during the week, I, I do electrical contracting and then starting on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, I am out exploring the Great Lakes uh, almost every single weekend year round. Um, somebody asks, have you been to the Lake Michigan Stonehenge site? Yes, I did a history channel, channel TV show about the Great Lakes Stonehenge. Um, when I first started diving, I actually got state and national recognition. Uh, my first dive, I located a sinkhole in Traverse City and that made the news. My second dive, I located a, uh, I got really good pictures of a Ford Pinto that was underwater and that went viral. It was on the front page of the Grand Rapids Free Press and it was M live and it went all, all around, uh, internationally viral, uh, muscle car magazines would share it. And my third dive, I located the great Lake Stonehenge and it was like a needle in the haystack. Um, I was out looking for a shipwreck called the tramp and the tramp is a, a small wreck that's out by power Island. And I also free dive. So I was with uh, another diver that had went out with me that we were going to dive the tramp. Uh, long story short, I went out to find the tramp. I couldn't find the tramp. I didn't have sonar yet. Um, I was using the cell phone for the GPS. It wasn't working. So what I would do is dive down. It was about 45 feet deep. And I would go down about 30 feet or so free diving with no tanks, looking for the tramp. I couldn't see it. So instead of gearing up and putting all our scuba stuff on and not, you know, uh, seeing the shipwreck, I, I moved the boat several times and um, I gave up. It was the third time in the water. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, we probably just go scuba diving back in town, uh, back towards Traverse City at some other sites there. And uh, as I was driving away from Power Island, I stopped the boat and I just had a hunch that I needed to check uh, another spot. I threw the anchor out. Uh, it was a north wind. It positioned the bow perfectly in the middle of the stone circle. And I dove down and I recognized it because the uh, stone circle was shared on an episode of Ancient Aliens um, on History Channel. And I recognized the circle because the water clarity was so good. It was so cold. It was early season. So on my third dive, I refound the Great Lake Stone Circle. Uh, that made the Detroit Free Press and, and made, made national news again. Um, didn't do much with it for, for a long time. I, I dove it a lot. Uh, I mapped out the complete uh, drive line or rock line that leads up and away from it. Um, I made a YouTube video of it. And then some producers from the History Channel found me uh, from my YouTube video. And I did a TV show on cities. It's called uh, Cities of the Underworld. Uh, season four, episode four, America's Ancient Ancestors. And I'm featured on that as we explore the stone circle. And I did photogrammetry of the rock that supposedly has a Mastodon carving in it. And we explored the circle 
Um, so yes, I, I have uh, explored the stone circle. Uh, the coordinates are not public, um, but you know, I found it free diving. And it was this kind of uh, needle in the haystack moment, you know, uh, fate, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I really wanted to see it too when I was out there. So I had been thinking about it that day, really wanting to see it because I knew it was out, out by Power Island somewhere. But uh, so, yeah, if you guys want to want to check it out, it's uh, Cities of the Underworld Season 4, Episode 4. That's fascinating. Um, the next question is, uh, someone mentions finding a beach wreck near North Bar Lake over by Empire, and they're wondering which shipwreck it is. Um, that's very likely the Jenny, uh, Jenny and Annie is the name of the boat. Chris, I don't know if you know much more about that wreck. I, it being a beach wreck, it's probably not as um, of interest to you, but um, no, it isn't of interest. And if you guys go to my page and search Jenny and Annie, I have some really good pictures of it. Um, so there's two wrecks though. And the wreck by North Bar, it's actually uncovered right now. So if anybody in Leelanau County wants to take the walk to North Bar, uh, you can go see it. Now, I'm pretty sure that it's a different wreck than the Jenny and Annie, unless it's a piece of the Jenny and Annie. But the Jenny and Annie is about a mile south more towards empire and it's completely covered up with sand i actually just went last weekend to go see the jenny and annie uh and the north bar wreck but yeah the the north bar wreck might be a piece of the jenny and annie um they are fairly close to each other but i'm not positive that i do have some old um books with surveys from different wrecks that that i'm going to research that and look more into that so uh someone asked about what kind of cert certifications and training you need to do the kind of diving you're doing uh so i'm a trimix diver and i use helium and i go over 200 feet deep um i learned very fast i was a natural diver i had perfect trim and buoyancy uh right away in my dives and since I was a free diver, I grew up on the Great Lakes. Um, I was just a natural diver. You know, some people can pick up a, a guitar and, and learn how to play it. Uh, come here, boy. Oh, this is Milo. <laughs> um, I thought I would, he would say hi. But uh, so I, I was doing deeper dives. Uh, within two years, I was diving 200 feet deep, which is very, you know, quick to get to that point. But um so you got to work your way up. Uh, you start, you know, with your open water certificate, and then you get your advanced diving and then you can get, you know, into, uh, like some decompression diving, which in nitrox, uh, certificates, and then you work your way up to trimix diver. Um, so I'm a trimix diver and diving here in the great lakes is different than diving in the ocean a lot of people don't realize uh, how dangerous it is because the water is so cold it freezes your regulators and equipment so we have a much higher probability of equipment failure uh, which creates obviously uh, more danger um, but i was diving you know rocks um, 200 feet deep uh, in my second year of diving We also have a young man, he's 10, and he's wondering how young, like what ages can you start diving? That's a perfect age to start. So if you're interested in getting into it, um, you know, I don't know where you're from, but I would find where your closest local scuba shop is uh, in your area and just give them a call or go in there and talk to them about it. But uh, 10 is not too young. Um, a friend of mine, uh, that designed my website. Uh, his kids are diving and they're uh, right around that age and they're, they're great divers. Um, they're going to be, you know, the next generation tech divers here uh, coming up. So uh, it's good to see, you know, younger people getting into this because uh, if you start at that age, you know, by the time, you know, you're in your twenties, you're, you're going to be a very skilled diver and probably be able to dive anything you want. And honestly, like diving for me is very therapeutic. Um, so when I go underwater, you know, I basically turn off 
everything, you know, my, everything in my head, I don't get notifications on my cell phone. Uh, I'm not thinking about the jobs I got to do. I'm not thinking about the million things that I got going on in my life. It's only about what's underwater. And for that moment that it's peace and serenity, uh, and to get, to give yourself the opportunity to do that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so I, I, I would recommend you getting involved with scuba diving as soon as you can. Uh, we've got a couple people asking about when you dive um, on those really cold wrecks or at the cold time of years, are you cold? And how long can you stay down when it's that cold? Yeah, I dive year round. I chop holes through ice. Um, I just did an article with the Smithsonian Magazine and we were chopping holes through ice to go to the Kuka Shipwreck, which is rumored to be Al Capone's old speakeasy on Lake Charlevoix. And we did a really good story with the Smithsonian Magazine and UK Daily News. Um, so I dive year round. Yeah, it's cold. Uh, I'm a fifth generation here in Leelanau County and I'm used to the cold. You know, I can handle extreme cold. I ski um, cross country and I'm an avid hiker and just an adventurer that constantly is exploring ice caves and, 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 and all that. Um, so I'm exposing myself. The more you expose yourself to the cold, the more your body will get used to it. Uh, the water is a whole different deal. Um, I use a dry suit, but your face still gets wet. Your head still gets wet. Your skin goes completely numb and your lips turn purple, but you don't get frostbite because it's not cold enough to actually freeze. It's just above freezing. So, um, it gets very cold. Yes. Uh, some of our bottom times are on the deep dives are 30 minutes. And by the time that 30 minutes is up, you know, we're usually getting pretty cold. I don't have heated thermal undergarments like some of my dive team does. And I should get some and I probably will. Um, so they make heated undergarments that are electric heated, kind of like, uh, heated jackets and stuff they have nowadays. Uh, but I can handle the cold very well. I can handle, uh, you know, the pain and stuff very well. Um, you kind of just put it out of your head and, and get through your dive and complete the dive and the photography, but on the decompression portion of it. So a typical dive, you know, is around 70 minutes. It's 30 minutes on a bottom time on a 200 foot dive and about 40 to 45 minutes of decompression on mixed gases. Um, during the decompression can get very dangerous because you become you start to become hypothermic sometimes. Um, there's times where my whole body was shaking. There's times I haven't been able to move or feel my fingers. Uh, so yes, you get cold, but if you have the right gear and you kind of just ease into it, you can get used to it to where you can withstand it, but it's, it's extremely cold. Yes. Uh, someone asked about the types of cameras you're using underwater. Um, I won't go into specific specifics on that because there's a lot of people that, um, you know, try to mimic exactly what I do. Uh, there's been other divers that went out and bought my ex same exact camera housing and had the same settings and everything. Um, I didn't like that. It rubbed me the wrong way. It was a person I used to dive with a lot. So, uh, I use a Sony and I have a, I'm not going to tell you what, uh, brand of Sony, but I use a Sony camera and it's a mirrorless sony and i use a aquatica deep dive housing uh the deep dive housing is carved out of a solid block of aluminum and it goes up to 300 feet deep uh, the housing for the camera is around five thousand dollars so to do to put the setup together like i have it's a very particular setup to do wide angle photography um my setup was almost ten thousand dollars for my camera Uh, somebody asks what a typical like day diving is like for you. You know, how long does it take to, to get out to the site? How many dives do you do? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So a typical day. Um, so this picture here, for example, this is Fox, South Fox Island. Let's say uh, I leave Leland and I bring out um, usually snacks. Sometimes uh, I make a big charcuterie board uh in between between dives sometimes we um maybe have a little uh solo stove fire in a beach somewhere or something 
Um, so my typical dive day would be to go out and do the deep dive first and then have a break, possibly eat, uh, hang out, go to the second site. Uh, usually I do the second dive uh, fairly quickly. And then uh, the, the, the rest of the exploring would be shallow stuff. So I would do two deeper dives typically. And then I don't use my scuba tanks for the rest of the day because of the nitrogen and oxygen accumulation in my tissues. It's unsafe to continue to dive after that. Um, so we'll go and I'll free dive and I'll fly my drone and I'll find uh, the shallow shipwrecks that I've shared, you know, which I've done, uh, been on many more than I've shared. Um, so we usually go out and it's usually a whole day. It starts in the morning and we get the deeper dives done first. And then we spend the whole day visiting shallow shipwrecks, doing photo shoots, uh, just free diving, photo shoots, snorkeling. Um, you know, I, I don't snorkel myself. I just free dive, hold my breath. Uh, and, and then, you know, we might go hiking on the Manitou Islands or the Fox Islands, wherever, um, you know, wherever it might be. If we're in Munising, I'll go see pictured rocks in between the shipwrecks and we'll go inside caves. So we do, I usually do like geology diving and shipwreck diving and hiking and drone photography all in one day. And my day, you know, usually starts about 6 a.m. and it ends at sunset. So it might last till 12 to 14 hour day of doing this all day. We've got quite a few questions, so I'm trying to look through all of them and kind of summarize them. But a, a handful yeah. of asked, um, why do these ships collide so often? And, um, you know, what, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So uh, back, you know, in the 1800s and 1700s, uh, you know, mainly the 1800s um, and early 1900s, you know, we didn't have the modern technology. So we didn't have radar. And without radar, you know, if you're sailing a ship that's two, 300 feet long, that weighs, you know, however much these ships weigh, uh, it's very hard to steer away from the shoals. They can sneak up on you and you hit it and it's over. And a lot of the ships, same thing. So what happens is there's no radar, no modern technology, no cell phones, you know, no way to, to know that there's another ship coming at you in the fog are coming at you in the dark. And in the late 1800s, and even today, but we have radar and we have GPS, we didn't have that back then. So back then, all the ships wanted to get from port to port, from A to B, as fast as they could in a timely manner. And every ship used the same shipping lanes. So they all were using the same shipping lanes. So they were trying to use the quickest points, the safest points, you know, to get from A to B. And they would collide in the night. They would collide in the fog. Once you saw a ship and it's ringing its bell, uh, flashing the lantern, whatever they might be doing, blowing the whistle, it's too late to steer away and, and not have a collision. Because once you saw it, it's too late. The, the force of the both ships coming at each other there wasn't enough time to move the ship away to miss the collision. So they would just smash into each other. Uh, we have one attendee um, asking, you mentioned like finding wrecks on Google Earth and you were yeah. going to um, show a little bit or maybe you oh, yeah. have an upcoming thing. Can you go more into more detail on that? Yeah, so um, you can't find any deep wrecks, you know, anything about 30 feet or deeper, you typically can't see unless it's a perfect picture from the satellite from Google Earth uh, with very good water visibility, like this picture here. Um, so with Google Earth, the best way to use it is on the desktop or a laptop because the Google Earth Pro version is only on the desktop version. So if you get Google Earth Pro on a laptop or desktop, you can use this feature that's called Time Machine. In Time Machine, you can rewind the time from when the pictures were taken from present day all the way back years ago. And many years, the wind in that particular spot wouldn't be blowing or it would be very clear or the wreck wasn't buried under the sand. 
So you can use the time machine feature of Google Earth to locate uh, many, many shipwrecks. And I, I, I can't wait to show everybody um, all the shipwrecks around the Manitou Islands. So a good one to look at for everybody that's listening right now, if you want to try this, uh, look up the Francisco Morazan. And you can see it on Google Earth. It's labeled on Google Earth. So look up the Francis, Francisco Morazan. I shared that on this presentation. And it's on the uh, southwest side of South Manitou Island. And you can see the, the Morazan perfectly from Google Earth. And you can also see the Walter L. Frost, which is just about 150 feet uh, southwest of it. It was the wreck that the Morazan ran over. So those are two good wrecks to see for your first time seeing a wreck on Google Earth. And then there's a bunch of other wrecks that I've located that are shallow that I go out, I find them on Google Earth. I go out with my boat, I throw my drone up in the air, three, four, 500 feet. And I, I see these anomalies in the water and you can see an anomaly pretty easily because the ship has a dis distinctive shape. It's like a triangle, you know, or it has a point. So if you see that, a lot of times it's some wrecks. And, and just recently, um, I, I, I just located the J.S. Krause. So the J.S. Krause has been buried for probably 60, 70 years. And I just found it um, two weeks ago. Uh, and I took some drone shots and some underwater shots of it. And it's peeking out of the sand uh, near, near the Glen Haven dock. Um, so... These wrecks are, are fairly easy to find, but you got to find a few and I'll have to show everybody uh, like Donner Point. So if you go to Donner Point on North Manitou Island, look off Donner Point and, and, and look real close. There's three shipwrecks, uh, the Alvar Badley and the Walter T. Graves and the unknown wreck that I shared. Also, what's called the um, uh, they call it the Donner Point wreck. It's right on the beach of Donner Point. Um, so there's, there's four racks, you know, three, you can see real good with, with Google earth, but there's four, sometimes you can see of Donner point. Next question. Uh, someone asks if you've dove on the Carl Bradley and another question that's kind of connected to this is I know there's quite a bit of loss of life on Carl Bradley. When, when you're diving on racks that have had loss of life, do you ever feel that in kind of a, any way? I put all that out of my head before I go down. Um, I have not been on the Carl D. Bradley. Uh, it's a very deep rack. I probably won't dive that. That's more of a an ROV, uh, remote operated vehicle rack. Um, that's hundreds of feet deep. Uh, you know, so as far as like feeling spirits or having those sensations and stuff, um, when I do the dives, the deep dives and stuff like that, that there might be bones on the rack. Uh, there's racks that still have bodies in them. The cam loops has two bodies still in it um, that float around the engine room and eternal rigor mortis because Lake Superior is so cold, 34 degrees year round on the bottom at that depth that the bacteria doesn't grow in the body to make it bloat and rot. So you become eternally, uh, you have eternal rigor mortis. Um, so there's bodies down on some of these racks. It's very, very rare to see. Um, I personally haven't been on the Kamloops yet to see that, but I have been on racks that have had human bones on it. Um, you don't let any of that bother you. Uh, these are very technical, dangerous deep dives. And I solely focus on the technical uh, part of the dive, you know, my air, my dive, uh, time, decompression, uh, and the photography that I try not to get any, any feelings of any kind like that, because any feelings create problems with diving. So any panic is panic and stress and like fear are a diver's worst enemy, because what that does is it makes your heartbeat be irrational. Uh, that depth and that pressure is dangerous for you and you can make mistakes. You can breathe too fast, which will create free flows in your regulators um, so when I'm down there, you know, if I see human bones or something, it's just like another day. I don't even think twice about it. Um, just take my pictures, go on with the dive. Uh, I don't get any emotion when I dive. 
Uh, somebody asks, how do you do and like, what are the resources you look at to, to learn about the history of these wrecks? And um, someone's also asking about like resources for if they're wanting to get into this, you know, some of those wrecks that are publicly, those uh, coordinates are publicly available and people asking about snorkel wrecks too, those real shallow ones that they can do without the, the certifications and diving techniques. Yeah, good question. So uh, we have a lot of different literature that's available to read. There's tons of shipwreck books out there. Um, Chris Cole was an old diver that, that documented hundreds of shipwrecks and he has multiple books. Uh, I use his books. Um, we have not only the written uh, books, but we have archaeology, like archaeology books on the shipwrecks that you can read. Um, those are very informative and, and also uh, you know, might show the location, it might not. Some of it was in Loran instead of a GPS, and it's not always very accurate. That's why the drone and other tools that I use and sonar help. Um, but you can also, for like the shallow stuff, we have underwater preserve websites. So uh, like in Alpena, we have the um, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, I'm real good friends with the NOAA, uh, people over there, Thunder Bay, uh, they they run a great uh, website and it has, um, I think they have uh, a couple hundred shipwrecks that you can see over there and a lot of them are shallow and they're, the GPS coordinates are all there. Um, you can take a kayak to them and snorkel them or a Zodiac, you know, small boat, uh, what have you. So with the websites, you know, we have the shipwreck websites and then if it's not like NOAA, which they have the best website because it's government funded. Um, we, I'm, I'm also part of the uh, the Michigan Underwater Preserve Council, and I oversee uh, like the Manitou Passage, and I report conditions of wrecks and things that I see and find and things that disappear and reappear um, with the sand and stuff. So uh, the Michigan Underwater Preserves Council. Um, the M MUPC has multiple websites. So uh, we have a Manitou Passage website that has the racks on there and the coordinates. Um, and there's like a West Michigan site where there's a site for the Keweenaw. Uh, we have a site for Munising Pictured Rocks area with all those shallow racks. Um, you know, the, the Thumb has a site uh, and different areas in Michigan have different websites. Um, so those, the websites are, you know, for the, the average person are probably the best uh, tool to use to, to see the shallow shipwrecks. And then if you're ever wondering, if you're going to an area or, you, or you'd like to go and see a shipwreck, a shallow one, a certain area, just give me a, give me a message, send me a message and I'll direct you to the websites for the area. And also um, I'll tell you exactly where the wrecks are because I've been to most of them, so. Uh, we still have quite a few questions, but I know we yeah, have all evening, but a couple of them, again, kind of coordinate with each other. Um, somebody asks about when you find a wreck, do you have to disclose the location? And if so, to who? And then who is um, issuing these salvage permits um, on the West Moreland? <clears throat> so you don't, there's no law that says you have to report it. Um, it's it should be reported, but if you find a rack and it's shallow, it's probably already been found. So uh, the state of Michigan records this stuff, but they don't publicly release the coordinates. It's the person that found the rack is in charge of releasing the coordinates to the public. That's how it works. So if you find a rack or artifact and you think that it's never been found before, or you don't see it in any literature or any website, you can report that to the state and tell them what you found and pictures of it and stuff. Um, I, I would do that. And that keeps everything relevant within our community. That way we know what wrecks are, are around and what wrecks are under the sand and what people are finding and people found artifacts on the beach. Um, so I would report anything that you found, but no, there's not a law that says you have to. Uh, it's just, you know, a uh, a thing that should be done. You should should report it and take pictures of it and stuff. But um, as far as the Westmoreland goes, um, so Mammoth Distillery in Traverse City, 
uh, and Ross Richardson, the guy that found the Westmoreland, are trying to get some permits together to uh, bring some artifacts up and possibly some wood or actual whiskey if it's not, uh, if the barrels aren't bad yet. Um, will they do that? Will that get granted? Probably not. Uh, the problem is that, um, you know, I think, I think that some of that should, should go through, but what happens is, is that these artifacts need to find a forever home and a forever home, like a museum or anywhere, it costs money to house the artifacts. So we've already had so many thousands of artifacts removed from the ships throughout the Great Lakes that are already in museums. Not all our artifacts are even in museums or in storage units and in warehouses and stuff. So they're being stored professionally and it costs money. Um, somebody has to pay for that for life. So with the abundance of artifacts that we already have in museums and elsewhere, uh, it's very hard to get a permit granted to remove artifacts and stuff like that um, because it's hard to find a place that the, these artifacts are going to go uh, forever. And who's going to pay for that? And what's the plan? And how are they going to raise money to do that? Um, so it's very hard to get a permit to go through to do that. It, it's still legal to try to do it, but um, it's not something that's done very often these days. And I personally don't even know any rock um, in all the years that I've been diving that has had a permit that's went through to uh, salvage anything off of it. Well, I think we'll end with this question um, because it's probably one of the most famous shipwrecks beyond the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, the Griffin. Have you looked for the Griffin or what, um, what, what information do you have about that? Well, there's a gentleman in, in Charlevoix, um, just north of Traverse City here. He claims to have found it. He wrote a book on it. Um, do I think he found it? No. Do other people that I'm, you know, work with and stuff think he found it? No, but uh, I haven't researched his research, research enough to, to really, you know, see what he's got. But um, he found a shallow wreck uh, near the Poverty Islands. Um, and so it's like up by uh, the Straits of Mackinac. And uh it's real shallow. He claims that's the Griffin. Um, the Griffin had cannons on it. You know, um, there's no cannons on the site. Uh, there's differences in measurements and stuff. You know, I'm not saying he didn't find it because that's not, not my deal, not my place to say that. But my personal opinion is that it's not been found. Uh, you know, this is, this is an old wreck. This would, this would be the oldest shipwreck in all the Great Lakes. Um, and it had, I think, four or five cannons on it. It was a fur trading vessel. Um, you know, there's a lot of different rumors about the Griffin uh, that Native Americans might have killed everybody on it and took everything off of it and burned the ship. Um, there's, you know, lore and theory that it sank in very deep water. Um, but to have a rack that's in like 15 feet of water and it's the most prized uh, shipwreck in all the Great Lakes, um, it's kind of highly doubtful. That's my opinion because it would be so old that if it was in that area, um, I don't think there would really be much left of it being that shallow because of the ice sheets would be smashing it to pieces over time. Um, so yeah, the Griffin, I, I don't look for the Griffin myself. Uh, there is over 6,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes estimated, and that's a conservative figure, um, probably more than 10,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. So uh, I got a lifetime of wreck hunting, and I don't need to go out and find something that uh, 10 other people have been looking for their whole life and, and a couple people claim to have found it. Um, that's not something I'm going to look for. I'm going to look for things that are more, uh, you know, findable, more... Um, closer to present day than the Griffin would be because it's a better chance that they're there. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's been found and, and I'm personally not ever probably going to look for the Griffin. So.
Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're almost at nine o'clock, so we're going to wrap up. But if yeah. anyone has additional questions for Chris, please check his Facebook. He has a website. You can um, give that address to people. But I want to just wrap up and and thank everyone um, on behalf of the Lilina Historical Society for watching the program today. Um, so fascinating, and it's been wonderful. So thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. <laughs>